Loving God, we ask that you open our eyes and open our ears that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I sort of said during the children's message, uh, it was a quote that I had read that was anonymous. It says, life is not about how fast you run or how high you climb, but how well you bounce. And I really got to thinking about that. What did that really mean for me? I, I, I like the quote. I, don't, I wish I knew who wrote it. I didn't. Um, but I see it as a metaphor for the ability to encounter life's troubles and bounce back from it. I thought of living life well by bouncing, bouncing through disappointment, bouncing through worry, bouncing through frustration, bouncing until we're ready to get on with our day. At 54, it's a little bit harder for me to bounce because I basically fall and stay there, but it's an idea that, that might, might be helpful. See, I, I, read, I read several quotes this week. It was something I was sort of thinking about peace. And I read one actually from Hiawatha who said, every human longs for peace. So what, is, what if we sought peace rather than happiness? I think about that for a minute. What if we sought peace rather for happiness? The United States Constitution famously speaks of the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is clearly a good thing. The pursuit of happiness means different things for different people. Above all else, though, it, it means that we seek out a personal feeling, a personal emotion, a personal situation. We find too often today, and this may not affect you as much as it does a younger generation, that relationships are suffering. And they're suffering basically due to this cyber relationship thing going on with social media where there isn't that personal connection. And so all of this happiness that is happening you wonder how deep it really goes and how strong it really is. Think about work. Maybe you've heard folks say about work, work is a drag. Work is just no fun except for me. I love my work, right? Hour on Sundays. Work can be difficult for some. And, and think about it. Most people will work to make ends meet. Work, 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 doing things that we don't want to do, and it's just basically to be sure that there's enough at the end of the day to have the ends meet and, and to, to eat and, and just kind of go about life. That's kind of a bummer if you think about it long enough, and it's hard to do. So I pulled a famous quote from a famous person I thought fit it a little bit better from Mae West, which clearly the theologian Mae West might have a better idea. You only live once, but if you do it right... Once is enough. And so when I think about that idea of bouncing, and I think that idea of living life and living it full and, and not worrying about one end to the other, and well, I think Mae West was onto something. If we do it right, once is enough. We've all had bad weeks. I had a, a difficult week and, and, and a tough week, and my son wasn't feeling all that great and a bunch of things that I got to deal with. But I realized that, that as, as, as sore as he was having his wisdom teeth out and the dry socket that goes with that, and I'm not going to go into detail, but he was in a lot of pain. As a dad, I wanted like nothing more to take that pain on and take it away from him that he might not have to deal with that. And clearly, I know a lot of you would do the same thing because I know how you feel about your kids. Some, maybe not so much. Just kidding. But I always consider it to be a good dad to have my eyes on my kids and, and wanting what is best for them. I read a story about a little boy who lived up north, was eagerly looking forward to his birthday party with his friend, but his friend lived a few blocks away. When the day finally arrived, a fierce blizzard was making driving dangerous, but the little boy insisted that he wanted to go to this birthday party. He could walk to his friend's house, he told his dad, and he could do it all by himself. He didn't need any help. In fact, he didn't want any help. He was a big boy now. I can hear me telling my parents this. Still, his father hesitated, but dad, all the other kids will be there, and all the other kids are walking there. Finally, the father replied. He says, all right, if that's what you want to do. Overjoyed, the boy bundled up for the trip and plunged out into the storm, the snow swirling. He must have felt like an adventurer. 
had to feel just exciting, like he was in the big Yukon. But finally, he was there. He climbed up the porch steps and reached for the doorbell. As he did, he briefly turned to look back behind him, and out of the corner of the eye, his eye, he saw a figure darting behind a tree. And he realized it was his dad. He started out on this big trip through the white tundra, but there's no way his dad was going to let him take it on completely alone. But he let him think that he was. His dad didn't want him to get out of his sight and let him step into maybe danger without him having something to say or to do with that. When I read today's text, I was thinking about exactly that idea that as a father, I want to make sure I do what's best for my kids and I want to make sure I look out for them. I want to share with them maybe the best things that I can think of that I can pass along. I mean, what good is life for me as a dad to go through hard things and not share those stumbles with my kids so that maybe they don't have to make the same mistakes or make them in the same way? Peter is going on and talking about holiness and he's going on and he's sharing a life. He's sharing an idea coming from a background of making mistakes. That's why I love Peter. Peter understands his humanness. He understands that he doesn't always get it right, but he wants to share, hey, here's a way, let's not mess this. He started off our conversation talking about, you guys ought to be together. You guys ought to be unified in oneness. It was important for people, for folks to realize, you don't do stuff alone. You do it together. And especially when he's preaching to them and sharing with them the church, hey, be, be together in what you're doing. Don't go off on this adventure through the Yukon or whatever you pictured in your mind when that happened, alone. He shares, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. There's a comfort in knowing that God has his eyes on us at all times. Children want the eyes of their parents on them. As children of God, we love the fact that our Lord doesn't take his eyes off us. And the scripture suggests never. At all times. I'm filled with stories today. A man came home from work late. He was tired, irritated to find his five-year-old son waiting for him at the door. The son said, Daddy, may I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. What is it? Replied the man. Daddy, how much do you make an hour? Five-year-old. If you must know, I make $50 an hour. Oh, the little boy replied with his head down, may I please borrow $25? The father was furious. If the only reason you asked me so that you could borrow money to buy a silly toy or some other nonsense, then you march yourself straight to your room and go to bed. Then think about what you're doing and why you're being so selfish. I don't work hard every day for such childish frivolities. The little boy quietly went to his room and shut the door. The man sat down and started to get even angrier about the little boy's question. How dare he ask such a question? Only to get money. And after a little while, he calmed down. And he started to think maybe there's something the boy needed that $25 would cover. He really didn't ask for money very often. So the man went to the door of the little boy's room. He opened it and he said, are you asleep, son? He asked, yeah, no, daddy, I'm awake. I've been thinking maybe I was too hard on you earlier been a long day and I took out my aggravation on you. Here's the $25 that you asked for. The little boy sat straight up. Oh, thank you, daddy, he yelled. Then reaching under his pillow, he pulled out some crumpled bills. The man saw the little boy had money and started to get angry again. The little boy slowly counted out his money and then he looked up at the father. Why do you want some money if you already have some? Because I didn't have enough, but now I do. So daddy, I have $50 now. Can I buy an hour of your time? Please come home early tomorrow so we can play catch. I stood here yesterday at Joe McKee's funeral service. And in talking with Mark and talking with Steve, one of the things that really struck me was that, that Joe was a guy that worked hard he was working constantly. He did the jobs that he did with us. He did a tire retread store.
But when the story that kept coming up over and over and over again was, if Mark were to come home and ask Dad to go out and play catch, he would always stop what he was doing and go out and play catch. We can be busy in our lives, but our children just want to hang out. And for some of us, our grandchildren just want to hang out. They just want to be with us. I love my kids. As I mentioned, uh, as a father, I want to be Superman. I want to be Captain America. As a kid, I wanted to be Spider-Man. But, but when I'm bigger, I mean, I want to be everything that I can for my kids. But there are some times when they just want to have alone time. They just want to hang out. They just want to sit. Somehow, knowing that their father is around to take on the aches and pains, there's something special about that. It's a relationship I had with my dad. I shared a psalm with some new friends that I met this past week. I, I wanted them to know that God was intimacy because a lot of times what I do on Thursdays is I sort of get lost. And that's where I do my writing for the message for the day. I started in a place that was really nice and comfortable, usually a coffee shop because I drink too much coffee. But I ended up in Belle Glade, Florida. Have you ever been to Belle Glade, Florida? I've read stories. I've talked to friends. But until you've sat down in Belle Glade at the Dixie's Fried Chicken stand and had a conversation with some of the folks that live there, my friends, life is hard in Belle Glade, Florida. I might think that I'm having a hard week or a tough week, but I sat down with some folks and they know what a hard week is like. I shared with them that, that a Psalm 139 that I think about a lot when I think of hard situations and the love of God. It, it starts out, oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know, when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your hand will hold me fast. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then I shared, never are we outside our Lord's sight even in some of the most difficult circumstances. God knows us. God loves us. God is aware of the frustration that wears us out. God is aware of the dreams that we have dared to dream, even when everyone else doubted. God is aware that the fears that trouble us, the joys that fill our heart, God knows our disappointments, our heartaches that have come our way, God knows you and me, sees you, created you, and loves you and me. And my new friends in Belle Glade. In the midst of all that complicates our life, we need to remember that the eyes of the Lord are always on the righteous. But there's more. It doesn't just stop there. 1 Peter 3.12, and his ears are attentive to our prayer. His ears are trained towards those who are speaking and hanging out and talking with him. Our father's ears are with us. Chuck Swindoll shares in his book, Stress Fractures, he tells of one time finding himself in a bind with just too many commitments and not enough time in which to accomplish them. As a result, he became very nervous and very tense. He writes, I was snapping at my wife and our children choking down my food at mealtime and feeling irritated at any unexpected irritation during the day. No show of hands, but has anyone ever felt like that? All right, I admit. Before long, things around our home started reflecting the pattern of hurry-up style. It was becoming unbearable. He writes, I distinctly remember after one supper evening the words of our young daughter, Colleen, she wanted to tell me something important that had happened to her at school that day. She began hurriedly, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell you really fast. 
suddenly realizing his frustration or her frustration, he answered, honey, you can tell me and you don't have to tell me really fast. Say it slowly. And she said something that he'll never forget. She said, okay, then you listen slowly. It's that intimacy that children have with their parents, guys. It's that intimacy that children of God have with a loving God. When we walk around on this earth wondering, how did I get here? What happened? How did it get so difficult? It's because we've lost sight of the fact that our loving God is waiting to hear from us. Our loving God wants to commune with us, wants to hang out with us. And our loving God, our Father in heaven, has His eyes upon us. When? Always. Right now. And my imagination thinks that he listens slowly. If children want their father's or mother's ear, they want to be heard now. They want to be comforted by them now. They want to be led by them now. So why would we not share this with the people that we come in contact with. When we love others to love Christ, why wouldn't we share the fact that God wants to love them now? See, because it says, Peter goes on further in this training, whoever would love life and see good days, it says in verse 11, he must search for peace and pursue it. If ever there was an imperative for us to look at in the scriptures, Peter is giving it search for peace and pursue it. Think about those two ideas together. When you search for something, generally you search for it until you find it. And then you're done with it, like keys that somehow get lost in my house on a regular basis. It's one of those things where someone might say, well, I found them in the last place that I looked. Right? Think about that. If you found him, why do you keep looking? It's always the last place. Search, but the pursue is different. They have different meanings. To search, to seek, is to find something that you do not currently have. That's the search for peace. But to pursue is to go after and follow something that you have found. Scripture teaches us that Jesus in, in Isaiah 9, 6 is the Prince of Peace. Search for peace and then pursue it. Follow. It's a beautiful relationship that these two have. Charles Spurgeon once testified, I looked at Christ and the dove of peace flew into my heart. I looked at the dove of peace and it flew. We seek peace for happiness. The Bible mentions seeking peace 400 times. So how do we do it? How, how do we seek peace? How, how, how do we apply peace to a life that has no peace involved? It's almost like I want to give you the formula. That's kind of how I work. I want to know the formula so I can apply it and then I can see the results on the backside. Jesus being the Prince of Peace. There are five foundations that we can think about with this that we get from the scriptures. Romans 5, peace is reconciliation. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, that's reconciliation. Peace is also for fellowship. 1 John 1, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As Peter was preaching, peace is also about unity. In Ephesians 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Peace is, peace is assurance. In 2 Timothy, convinced that he is able to guard what I have trusted for him that day. Assurance that my Lord will guard our peace. And then peace is contentment in any and all situation. As a father, I realize how much my Father in Heaven calls me and pleads me, encourages me, and you, to consider paying attention to Him, to focus on Him, to follow Him. 2 Chronicles 7.14 encourages just such a statement. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will hear their land. That sounds a lot like peace. Seek peace and pursue it. As a dad, I I love because Jesus Christ first loved me and gave himself for me, dying on a cross for me and rose from the dead on the third day for me so I can live out all eternity with God the Father. Same is true for you. The same is true for the stranger that we meet at lunch today. Or as we walk through a mall later today. Or as we go visit folks that have real problems. I love my kids like I love the strangers that I meet. Why would I want anything less for them than what has been bestowed upon me? And that's love. My friends, if you have troubles, if you have things that you deal with, my numbers are listed in the bulletin, both at the office and then my cell is on 24 hours a day. Try not to call at three in the morning if you can help it. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.